And good evening. He used to be called America's mayor, but now Trump's former lawyer finding himself on the other side of the law. Rudy Giuliani now at the center of an investigation into election meddling in Georgia. Giuliani's attorneys telling NBC News they were informed he was the, quote, target of the probe just days before he's set to testify before a grand jury in Atlanta. He was subpoenaed last month as part of the investigation led by the Fulton County District Attorney. You'll remember Rudy amplified former President Trump's unfounded claims of election fraud, repeatedly alleging that Georgia's voting systems altered ballots despite a hand count audit that confirmed President Biden's victory in that state. A federal judge also denying Senator Lindsey Graham's attempts to avoid testifying before that same grand jury after he tried to claim legislative privilege. I want to get right to our chief White House correspondent, Kristen Welker, on this. So, Kristen, walk our viewers through what we know about this investigation. Well, this could be a significant development. A lawyer for Rudy Giuliani tells NBC News he's now a target of the criminal investigation in Georgia into former President Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. That lawyer had previously said Giuliani was a witness. Giuliani was President Trump's attorney at the time and played a major role in trying to change the election outcome in Georgia. Now, legal experts tell NBC News being labeled a target means prosecutors are looking more closely at whether Giuliani committed a crime. The DA's office has not commented. Giuliani is expected to testify in person before the grand jury on Wednesday, despite asking for a delay citing health reasons. The DA's office offered to pay for a bus or train ticket for him. Now, according to Giuliani's attorney, he will likely invoke attorney-client privilege to avoid answering questions about his conversations with the former president, Tom. And, Chris, I'm also seeing these new reports that another close ally of the former president, Senator Lindsey Graham, is also being asked to testify? That's absolutely right. A federal judge, in fact, today, rejected efforts by Senator Lindsey Graham to avoid testifying before the grand jury in Atlanta. The judge writing in the ruling that the district attorney had shown extraordinary circumstances and a special need for Senator Graham's testimony on issues relating to alleged attempts to influence the 2020 results in Georgia. Now, Graham will appeal, Tom, but he's scheduled to appear later this month at this point, so we'll watch it closely. All right, Kristen Welker, leading us off tonight. Kristen, we thank you for that. And since the FBI entered Mar-a-Lago, there's been an increased threat against federal law enforcement. Many of the threats made online, but at least one suspect now facing criminal charges. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell has those details. Tonight, federal agents at heightened risk. Barriers up at FBI offices and Secret Service posts hardened against new threats motivated by anger over the FBI search at Mar-a-Lago. Today, these federal court documents show a Pennsylvania man charged after making online threats to kill FBI agents. These chilling words among the more tame of the man's inflammatory posts from this past week, according to court documents. If you work for the FBI, then you deserve to die. And in another, my only goal is to kill more of them before I drop. Today, former President Donald Trump told Fox News, the temperature has to be brought down in the country. If it isn't, terrible things are going to happen. But often it is Mr. Trump striking a match with his social media posts, accusing the FBI of being corrupt or planting information, despite days of sharing incendiary content about federal law enforcement. Today, the former president inserted himself as a peacemaker. If there is anything we can do to help, I and my people would certainly be willing to do that. The FBI and Homeland Security issued a joint intelligence bulletin this weekend, warning of calls for violence against federal law enforcement, government and judicial personnel as a reaction to the search in Palm Beach. Some of the threats are specific and identify and propose targets, tactics and weaponry. Many threats are spreading online, and some include personal information, such as home addresses, identification of family members as additional targets. The Justice Department, in a new motion, is asking that the search warrant affidavit remain sealed following a request by news organizations, including NBC News, that it be made public. Prosecutors wrote, disclosure now would cause significant and irreparable damage to this ongoing criminal investigation. Today, House Republicans on the Judiciary Committee sent letters to the Attorney General, FBI Director, and White House Chief of Staff, requesting they save and provide all communications related to the search at Mar-a-Lago. 
while former Trump national security adviser John Bolton disputes a key defense offered by the former president, that he regularly declassified secret materials he kept. I was never aware of anything even remotely approximating that policy, uh, and I haven't heard anything uh, of it uh, since I left. Uh, if he, in fact, said something like that, when was it memorialized? When did the White House counsel write it down? All right, Kelly O'Donnell joins us now from the White House. Kelly, I know there have been a lot of new developments late today. The former president also making another accusation against the FBI about something that was taken. Tom, after he said he wanted to lower the temperature, Mr. Trump posted on his social media that the FBI, quote, stole his passports, including one that, it is, that had expired. And he further labeled this action by the government as an assault on a political opponent. Government sources have not confirmed to us whether the passports are among items taken from Mar-a-Lago. So, Kelly, you know, one of the big questions we've all had since this story is broken is what was in the affidavits as well. There'd be more information in that. I know you have some new reporting about the access to those documents and what may or may not happen. Well, prosecutors say the affidavit here is very different than what we saw made public in the inventory that told us about how many boxes of classified information was there. And prosecutors say they do not want the affidavit made public because it would serve as a roadmap to the government's ongoing investigation and that the investigation implicates highly classified materials, which further underscores the need to protect the integrity of the investigation. And that suggests this was not just about getting documents back, but it's an active criminal investigation. Tom? Kelly O from the White House. Kelly, thank you. We want to switch gears now. We do have an update from that brutal stabbing of Salman Rushdie. The renowned author now off a ventilator and speaking just three days after he was attacked on a New York stage, stabbed in the neck. Iran tonight breaking its silence, claiming it had nothing to do with the plot after decades of trying to hunt him down. But experts that study Iran say it's unlikely the assailant acted on his own. Andrea Mitchell has more. Acclaimed author Salman Rushdie in critical condition after Friday's vicious stabbing. <laughs> Tonight recovering from serious wounds to his neck, chest and abdomen, including his liver. A spokesman says off a ventilator, able to speak. The suspect, 24-year-old Hati Matar, now charged with second-degree attempted murder and assault, pleading not guilty. Law enforcement officials say the investigation is still in the early stages, but they believe he is a lone actor. Authorities say an Iranian flag was found at his home, along with pictures of Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian military leader the U.S. killed in 2020, on his computer. Thirty-three years after Iran issued a death threat against Rushdie for writing a novel, Satanic Verses, infuriating fundamentalists, today Iran's government denied any connection to the attack, but said Rushdie brought it on himself. Do you have a reaction to the Iranian government blaming the victim here, Salman Rushdie, for this attack? I do. It's despicable. It's disgusting. Uh, we condemn it. Some experts find it unlikely Mater acted alone. It's very unlikely that a 24-year-old young man, Lebanese-American, born and raised in the United States, who was born after the 1989 Khomeini fatwa against Salman Rushdie, is going to radicalize on his own without any connection to the Iranian government. And now concerns about a possible copycat threat. After noted author J.K. Rowling tweeting about Rushdie, horrifying news, let him be okay. A user replying, don't worry, you are next. Rowling saying police are involved. All right, Andrea Mitchell joins Top Story live tonight from Washington. So, Andrea, as we heard in your report there, Iran has denied any involvement in this attack. But we, of course, want to remind our viewers this comes after decades of trying to hunt this author down, even putting a bounty on his head. The stabbing comes, though, also amid rising tensions with the U.S. as well. Well, we should also point out that Iran is not monolithic. The Iranian regime is led by, of course, the Ayatollah Khamenei, but also by the Revolutionary Guard. They control the economy, they control the military, and they are the real powerhouses. And they've been accused credibly by the United States of this most recent attempt to assassinate uh, John Bolton. And we understand from our reporting that they've also targeted other top former officials in the Trump administration, Mike Pompeo, Mike, uh, Mark Esper, the defense secretary, you know, Robert O'Brien, the national security advisor who succeeded John Bolton. So there is a track record here and a feeling that investigators want to know more about whether or not this man, this suspect, this 24-year-old who was born, you know, years after the fatwa could 
not have read Satanic Verses and you know, after all of this had happened, whether he really was self-radicalized or he, if he has some connection to Iran. Okay, Andrea Mitchell for us tonight. Andrea, we appreciate yeah. all of that. Now to Mexico, where federal officials are dealing with a wave of violent attacks. They're deploying hundreds of troops to the border city of Tijuana, all in an effort to help with the violence from cartels that has left dozens of businesses and vehicles destroyed. Tourists attending a soccer match at a popular music festival caught in the nearby violence. NBC's Guad Venegas has more. A week of attacks across Mexico. Dozens of stores, cars, buses, and trucks set on fire. Chaos erupting among the public and images of the destruction going viral. Today, federal authorities calling it a propaganda by criminal organizations attempting to assert their power. They say it's all in response to recent successful military operations detaining cartel members and securing weapons, vehicles, and drugs. But the city remains on edge. In the city of Tijuana and its surroundings, authorities say at least 24 vehicles were set on fire Friday night. Public transportation coming to a halt with drivers too scared to operate. I see they uh, take off the people from the bus and, uh, and they throw the, the gas in the, in, the, in the bus and burning. I feel unsafe too, yeah. The U.S. consulate asking Americans to shelter in place or avoid crossing into Mexico from California. But for some Americans, it came too late. Many were attending a professional soccer match and the Baja Beach Music Festival, where some chose to stay despite the nearby violence. It's just uncertainty that you just don't know what can happen. Like, you don't know, like, because, you know, they're advising everyone to stay indoors. But it's like, we're, we're going to a festival, you know. Authorities say the same type of fires and roadblocks took place in Jalisco and Guanajuato days before. Today, members of the president's cabinet informed 36 people have been arrested across the country, directly linked to the violence, including the fires and roadblocks. Government officials have identified at least three of them as members of the new generation Jalisco cartel. Meanwhile, over the weekend, 300 members of the military's special forces arrived in Tijuana to join the efforts by police and National Guard attempting to maintain the peace in the streets. All right, Guad Venegas joins Top Story live from Miami tonight. So, Guad, I want to ask you, over the weekend, there were reports of 11 people killed as a result of a clash between cartels in the border city of Juarez. So you have Tijuana on one side, Juarez on the other, both border towns. So I have to ask, is the U.S. monitoring this wave of violence, and, and what can they do, if anything? Tom, the U.S. is monitoring, the whole world is monitoring what happens in Mexico. They receive a lot of tourism in the border cities and other parts of the country. What we can say is that according to Mexican authorities, these incidents were different. The incidents in Ciudad Juarez were the clash of two cartels, right? They say, authorities say, it was the Juarez cartel versus the Sinaloa cartel inside a prison. The other incidents that uh, we saw in all these images are incidents that they say were just a demonstration of power that did not leave any dead. Now, they did note that in the city of Tijuana, there is three cartels that are fighting for control. You've got the Sinaloa cartel, Arellano cartel, and the New Generation cartel. Now, they added that sending in the military and special forces should keep the streets safe. The real test, Tom, will be the next few days to see if the police and the military really do have control of the streets in cities like Tijuana. And if any Tom. of that violence spills over the border as well. All right, Guad Venegas for us tonight. Guad, we appreciate it. We want to head overseas now to the latest on Brittany Griner's detention in a Russian prison. There is a major update tonight. The women's basketball star is challenging her conviction after she pleaded guilty to drug charges. Josh Letterman has the latest and a possible prisoner swap as well that could bring her home. Tonight, imprisoned WNBA star Brittany Griner's lawyers appealing her recent conviction in Russian court, even as the U.S. and Russia pursue delicate negotiations for a prisoner swap. The move comes two weeks after Griner was sentenced to nine years in a penal colony for drug possession and smuggling, stemming from a February incident in which she was caught trying to enter Russia with cannabis oil. Griner pleaded guilty to the drug charges but maintained it was an accident. I made an honest mistake and I hope that in your ruling, that it doesn't end my life here. Griner's appeal could take months, and Russian officials have suggested Griner wouldn't be released until the full legal process plays out. But tonight, the State Department saying there's no reason her appeal should delay a deal to bring her home. 
No element of uh, this trial um, changes our judgment uh, that Brittany Griner is being wrongfully detained uh, and should be released immediately. We are in communication uh, with the Russians. Former State Department official Joel Rubin says the appeal will continue applying pressure on Russia, but that the final decision is still in the Russian president's hands. That for Vladimir Putin, the question will be, when does he find it in his maximum political interest to let her go? Uh, when does he need to make the trade? When does he need to get a bump back at home for propaganda purposes? Uh, right now, he doesn't seem to feel that need. Today's appeal comes amid talks between the U.S. and Russian diplomats over a potential swap in which Russia would exchange Griner and former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan for convicted Russian arms dealer Victor Boot. Those talks reportedly complicated by the Biden administration's public comments about the possible swap, which one Russian official characterized as megaphone diplomacy. Former U.S. diplomat Bill Richardson, who has assisted in efforts to get Griner home, weighed in on the administration's tactics on ABC News. I wouldn't have gone public uh, as much as they did, but it was done sometimes when negotiations are not working. You want to throw a little bit of a bomb, and I think that's what they did. Griner's Russian lawyer explaining their reaction to the verdict on the BBC's Ukraine cast. It does seem like a very harsh sentence, yes, considering the amount of the substance and considering how guilty plea. All right, Josh Letterman joins Top Story tonight. So Griner's lawyer, we just heard her there, mentioned that she thought the sentence was unusually harsh. What is the typical punishment for this kind of crime in Russia? Well, her legal team says it's usually about five or six years with the possibility of parole. And remember, she was caught with a very small amount of cannabis oil, uh, less than a gram. Uh, and her lawyers say it was not recreational. They say she has a valid prescription in the U.S. for medical marijuana and simply left it in her luggage by accident. Tom? So, Josh, I, I, while I have you, I have one more question for you. And I understand there is so much going on in Ukraine right now. But I'm, I am curious, is this case at all generating any type of headlines where you are over there? Not so much in Ukraine, but they are clearly very attuned to the way that Russia is approaching its relations with the West, with the U.S., its willingness to do a prisoner swap, uh, its willingness to talk about with the U.S. Uh, about broader issues in hopes that there could be some effort uh, by the U.S. and other Western nations to force Russia to back down, Tom. Josh Letterman from Kiev for us tonight. Back here at home, time for power and politics in the primary fight involving embattled Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney, the leading Trump critic, of course, in her party, facing off against a candidate backed by the former president. Vaughn Hilliard is in Wyoming tonight, where Cheney is fighting for her political life. There may be no greater political antagonist to Donald Trump than Liz Cheney. This is Donald Trump's legacy, but it cannot be the future of our nation. Trump, in turn, has declared her re-election campaign to be his biggest target. She really represents despicable things. Cheney voted to impeach him after the insurrection uh, yeah. at the Capitol last year and is now vice chair Today, of the January 6th Select saw. Committee. President Trump summoned a mob to Washington for January 6th. But back home in the deep red state of Wyoming, she's on the cusp of losing. Why not Liz Cheney? I think because she went against Trump. She voted for, for yeah. the impeachment. She's a sellout. Yes, betrayal. Vowing to oust her from office, fellow Republican Harriet Hageman, a land use attorney backed by the former president. We're fed up with Liz Cheney. Liz, you're fired. Get out of here. Now Cheney needs help from Democrats. A month ago, I changed my affiliation to Republican so that I could vote for Liz Cheney. She promotes democracy. But even if every Democrat changed their voter registration, it'd still be an uphill climb for Cheney. Wyoming Republicans outnumbered Democrats by four to one here. And the multiple investigations into Donald Trump have not moved many Republican voters. In the final days before the vote, Cheney turning for help from her famous father, who first won this very congressional seat 44 years ago. There is nothing more important she will ever do than lead the effort to make sure Donald Trump is never again near the Oval Office. All right, Vaughn Hillier joins us now live from Wyoming. So Vaughn, if Cheney loses tomorrow, and you really don't have to be a political expert to realize that this is a very, very tough race for her, what is next for her? 
You know, that's where I was talking to an aide of hers who said, look, tomorrow is just the first battle of what she intends to be a long and much bigger long-term fight here. This is something where, I mean, it could be a potential 2024 presidential bid herself, but this is just one of those steps in which she has said that she is going to do everything she can to stick by her principles, not capitulate to political pressures within her party, and do whatever it takes to try to keep Donald Trump from getting back into the White House again, Tom. All right, Vaughn, I'm sure we're going to be checking in with you tomorrow as everyone watches that race there in Wyoming. Vaughn, thank you for that. This week's primary is the latest test for President Trump's influence over Republican voters. And with the former president and his allies blasting the FBI search of his home, will establishment Republicans like Congresswoman Liz Cheney be able to hold on? Susan Del Percio is an NBC News political analyst and a Republican strategist. And Matthew Dowd, he's a chief, was the chief strategist for the Bush Cheney 2004 presidential campaign. He's the founder of Country Over Party. Guys, I want to ask you real quick. I want to start where Vaughn just left off there. If Liz Cheney loses, what's next for her? I, I think a president run is possible. I don't, I, I don't think she has will have much success on, on the Republican side, maybe if she runs as a third party candidate. But I'm interested in what you guys think happens to Liz Cheney if she loses tomorrow. So, Ma yeah, Matt, I'm sorry. Well, I should I say Matt or Susan. Yeah, yeah. You guys start. <laughs> uh, so, I, I mean, I, I think she's probably going to lose tomorrow if all the polls are to be believed and it's going to be a bad loss. But I think she's put her integrity on the line. So I think she wins in that regard and fighting for democracy in our Constitution. I don't think there is a path to actually win the Republican nomination for president for her, but I don't think that's her point. I think her point is to raise the concern that she has about Donald Trump and other people in the Republican Party, how they have become anti-Constitution, anti-democratic in the course of this. And I think she is going to have a national profile to do that. She may run just to continue to increase the ability to send that message. All right, Susan, and, you, and what are your thoughts on Liz Cheney's political future? Well, I think two words come from to mind from uh, Van Hillard's uh, reporting, and that is legacy and future. What is her legacy? What is her future? I think it's very bright, not necessarily as a presidential candidate, but maybe she becomes in two, maybe four, six, eight years, she could be the head of the Republican Party once it finally burns itself to the ground with, along with Donald Trump. There's a lot of options out there, but she is a strong voice. She's a strong conservative voice. That's what a lot of people are looking for who used to be Republicans or who are done with Donald Trump. It won't be quick. It won't be fast. But she is there for the long game. I, I think that timeline may be a little longer, Susan, but we're going to have to wait and see. I do want to ask you, though, I want to start with what, you know, I want to talk about what we started the show with, which is, of course, the, the FBI raid at Mar-a-Lago. Do, do you think that is going to give some motivation to Republican voters? Is, is this going to ignite a fire in their bellies to go out and vote more in the midterms? I well, don't think to me, this alone will uh, do much. Oh. So go ahead, Susan. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to do much in this instance. Um, it depends where we are two months from now, though. That's the big question. Is there indictment? I would argue that the jury selection in late October for the Manhattan uh, criminal court uh, case against Tr the Trump organization will be a lot more of a motivating factor than this right in this time. You know, Matt, but before you start, Joe Biden had such a big week last week, and, and, and he needed that because he's, he's had a very tough several few months. Um, he passed that monster bill. Democrats are motivated with the Supreme Court and, of course, what happened with abortion. It seemed like there was some real momentum than, than Democrats had earlier this year. They're still facing some headwinds, of course, with inflation and the economy. But do you think that the FBI seizure there at Mar-a-Lago, do you think that could motivate Republicans the way that we saw voters come out in Kansas on the issue of abortion? I don't think the Republicans can be any more motivated than they already were because they're so mad at Joe Biden and the Democrats. I actually think this is if you're a strategist in the midst of this, having a former president be investigated for something related to a corruption and having Donald Trump part of the equation in the general election as we face this less than 90 days away is not a good thing for Republicans. Every time Donald Trump raises his head, Republicans drop. Every time Donald Trump raises his head, Republicans fall in general election. It happened in 2018. It happened in 2020. And if he's front and center because of this, what happened in, in, in Mar-a-Lago, it may increase motivation some, but it's going to help Democrats more. 
Susan, we're also going to be paying a close attention to Alaska's primaries tomorrow night. You have a sitting senator, Lisa Murkowski, facing off against a Trump-backed candidate. And the state is also holding a special election for its open house seat with former Governor Sarah Palin facing off against a businessman and a former Democrat uh, representative. It's the first year with ranked choice voting, so we won't know the results right away. But what will you be watching for? Uh, well, I'm watching Lisa Murkowski the closest. I think she has a very good chance of pulling this off. She's been a very good senator for her constituents. And I don't think the Trump brand has as much as an influence, especially with Murkowski in Alaska. The last time she ran, she did it on a writing campaign. It's People know her and they like her. When it comes to Sarah Palin, I think as much as I don't want to see her, it looks like she's probably going to pull this one out. Yeah. Matt, you know, you, you brought up an interesting point about uh, sort of general matchups, but both Murkowski and Cheney are from prominent Republican families, a lot of name recognition, a willingness to vote against their party. And NBC News tally has President Trump, get this, Matt, at a roughly 90 percent success rate for endorsements so far in the primaries. Do you think those races will be more indica indicative of the depth of the Trump effect or how voters feel about establishment Republicans? Well, I think we've already sort of got a conclusion on the Trump effect. Donald Trump owns the Republican Party today. Donald Trump's crazy theories and conspiracies and all that is part of the Republican DNA today. It is the Republican Party. So gauging wins or losses with Donald Trump, I think the question becomes, which is, I think, a difference between Lisa Murkowski, where independents and, and because of ranked choice voting, where independents and Democrats can make, make the difference in that race, which I think she'll pull out. Liz Cheney depends on Republicans, and Republicans are completely subsumed by Donald Trump, and that's a negative for her. So it is a party. They could rename the party Donald Trump. It is Donald Trump's Re Republican Party. Matt, before you go, um, and we were talking about Liz Cheney and a, and a possible potential run down the road, I know you've been contemplating a lot uh, and, and tweeting a lot with Andrew Yang and his push to create a third party called the Forward Party. You know, and I, I've heard you for years talk about you know, what, what this country needs and the type of politicians th this country needs. So I'm curious why, you, if, if this is fair, a fair characterization, why you're against Andrew Yang doing what he's doing. Well, I, I think we're in a moment. I'm, I'm all for more choices. I, I've talked about an independent party for years and years and years, but we're in a moment where democracy's on the line and everybody has to put their, their self behind and say, what's in the interest of democracy? And today we have two political parties. One that is pro-democracy, you may disagree with them on issues, and one that has nominated a majority of their candidates who are election deniers, the Republicans, and conspiracy theorists. And so my thing in this, you have to choose in this moment. You may not agree with them on issues, and if the forward party puts candidates in place that allows election deniers to win, it's defeating democracy, which they say is for. I'm all for third party generally, but in this moment, people need to choose between one party that believes in it and one party that doesn't. Susan, you're part of a fractured party right now. You, you said at the top of this of this segment, what do you think happens? What happens to those never Trumpers, Republicans like yourself, who, who don't want to be part of a Republican party where, where Trump is a figurehead? Well, I think people like myself stay in the party because we know it's a two party country and we need to have somebody in the party speaking out on those values. It's not an easy thing to do. But to Matt's point, you want to have a voice out there that is for good governance. And frankly, having a Republican go out there, much like the January 6th uh, Select Committee hearings, talking about Donald Trump and taking it down and talking about democracy and values, I think is, is worth a lot. Susan and Matt, we thank you for your time here on Top Story. Still ahead, the crime spree confession, the man accused of plowing through a crowd at a charity event. You see him right here. What he allegedly told investigators about that crime and the brutal killing of his own mother. Plus, the new video showing deputies trying to save a man from a burning and exploding boat. What they did just as the boat began to collapse. And a major warning for parents, the massive recall just announced for a very popular brand of infant swings and rockers after at least one death. Stay with us. All right, now to Pennsylvania, where a community is reeling after a man crashed his car into a crowd of people during a charity fundraiser, killing one person and leaving dozens injured. Police saying the suspect confessed to this crime and then told police he also killed his own mother. NBC's George Solis spoke to a survivor of that terrifying attack. Accused killer Adrian Ray is saying little to reporters. 
but according to authorities, confessing to chilling crimes in the tight-knit community of Berwick, Pennsylvania this weekend. Court documents obtained by NBC News say the 24-year-old admitted he drove his car into a crowd of people gathered for a charity event, killing a 50-year-old woman and injuring 17 others. This car came out of nowhere and it hit me. He was going like 60, 70 miles an hour. Roseanne Tortorella was one of the lucky ones, returning to the scene today to pay her respects. I flew and hit the, 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 the concrete there. I couldn't get up, I couldn't breathe. It was just, it was horrible. I thought I was dead. Videos posted to social media show children and families gathered as they raise money for the victims of a deadly house fire that killed 10 people in a neighboring town. Ray is telling investigators, I didn't ram them, I just ran them over. Not many people would be able to come to the scene of this yeah. trauma. You found it difficult to come here today? I did, and I had support. You can't move on from a tragedy like this, especially if you're involved in it. The suspect also confessing to killing his mother, 56-year-old Rosa Reyes. Fueled by escalating frustration with her, police say Reyes fled the scene of the crash, drove about a mile, and accelerated towards his mother, striking her and then beating her with a hammer. Reyes telling police they fought over money, and he, quote, wanted to be done with it. The pair of tragedies unfolding as funerals for the victims of the house fire continue. Sunday, a procession of first responders drove past the crash site, many with friends and relatives who lost loved ones in the fire. Of those 17 people, several of them are families of those who were taken in the house fire. I mean, the benefit was for um, specifically the three children that lost their lives in the fire. Tonight, the pain in small town America is great, but the sense of community is even larger. I keep saying we're, we're small but mighty, but the way they pulled together um, has been phenomenal. All right, George joins top story from Berwick, Pennsylvania tonight. And George, we see that memorial there behind you still growing. You mentioned there were 17 people hurt in this wild attack. Do we know how they're doing tonight? Tom, some good news in this. Some of the victims are able to go home and are now recovering at home, but still four people are in critical condition tonight. Now that suspect, Adrian Reyes, is due back in court later this month. NBC News did reach out to the Reyes family for comment, but they declined. Tom. All right, we are back now with Top Stories Newsfeed, and we begin with the arrest and the fatal shooting of a beloved youth football coach in Texas. Police say 39-year-old Yakub Talib surrendered this morning. He's the brother of former NFL star Akib Talib. Police say he shot and killed a rival coach after a fight broke out during a youth a football game in the Dallas area Saturday night. He's now facing first-degree murder charges. Two Florida police officers hailed as heroes after a daring rescue that was all caught on camera. Check out this video. You can hear the explosion right there. The cell phone video shows the explosions erupting as two deputies try to save an unconscious man from a burning boat near Port St. Lucie. The deputies managing to pull the man from the cabin as part of the boat began to actually collapse. The victim was taken to the hospital. Neither deputy was injured, but they say the flames were so hot, part of the boat melted. And a consumer alert, more than 2 million infant swings at Rockers had been recalled following the death of a 10-month-old. The recall includes four Mom, uh, four moms popular Mamaroo baby swings that use a three-point harness and one model of the Rockaroo. Safety regulators say straps can dangle below the product and crawling infants can get caught in them. Customers should contact the company for a free strap fastener. We have more information on our website, NBCNews.com. All right, we are back now with Top Stories Global Watch and the latest on a deadly church fire in Egypt. Video showing the fire ripping through a packed Coptic church in Cairo. At least 41 people killed, including more than a dozen children. Eyewitnesses say some worshipers attempted to jump from the four-story building to escape the flames. Investigators believe a short circuit is to blame. Next to the deadly explosion caught on camera in Armenia. New video shows the powerful blast tearing through a fireworks depot in the country's capital. People nearby running from plumes of smoke, at least seven people killed, dozens more injured. Rescuers now searching the debris for more than 20 missing. No word yet on what caused the fireworks to ignite. 
And Norway has euthanized a walrus who captured the hearts around the world. The 1,300-pound animal known as Freya became an online sensation this summer after video showed her trying to sunbathe on small boats and sinking them. Authorities say the tough decision was made for public safety after crowds ignored repeated warnings to stay away from her. People even seen swimming with her or bringing their children dangerously close. Okay, when we come back, the patient so close to death and the medical team that would not give up. The incredible 400 plus day journey to a new life when we come back. Finally tonight, after more than 400 days in the hospital, a Chicago woman is getting a second shot at life after several setbacks and near death experiences, all because her medical team would not give up. In May of 2020, Chicago Southside resident Colette Hurd rushed to the ER after feeling short of breath. So when I got there to the emergency room, um, they said, well, we know you're not going home. The cardiologist on call diagnosed Colette with pulmonary hypertension, a type of high blood pressure that weakens the lungs and in Colette's case, other organs. So she had lung failure and kidney failure. And so she really required uh, both a lung transplant and a kidney transplant together. Colette was admitted to Northwestern's ICU and quickly placed on the transplant list for both lungs and a kidney. We got much more sicker to the point that uh, she required dialysis and uh, she was one of our sickest patients in the hospital. While Colette's condition continued to deteriorate, the search for a new set of organs proved difficult. She had an incredible amount of antibodies against any kind of organ donor, donor tissue. So um, it, is, it was almost impossible for her to get a, a perfect match. Through a year of waiting, Colette's husband, Dennis, and the ICU team celebrated Thanksgiving, Christmas, Valentine's Day, and St. Patty's Day. Happy St. Patty's Day! A lot of days, I didn't have anybody to talk to. So they would talk to me and then we just established a relationship. All part of a 422 day stay in the hospital. But even with all of those efforts to remain positive. We had to take a, a major risk in her situation because um, she almost died on us multiple times and she was getting to the point that she couldn't wait any longer. The Northwestern transplant team decided they couldn't wait for a perfect match. They went ahead with a risky, unprecedented procedure. So we had to accept organs, even though she would had a positive cross match against them. And that really pushes the paradigm of what we know in transplantation. And now, with a new pair of lungs and a new kidney. I renamed myself Colette 2.0. I'm the one that proves. It means a lot to me that I have a second chance at life. After 422 days in the hospital, Colette 2.0, leaving with a smile. Hey, girls! <laughs> Thankful for that team that never gave up. They never gave up on me, you know. Um, even though I had some other things going on with my antibodies, they never gave up. They always tried to think out the side of the box. Colette 2.0 looking better than ever. And a big thanks to that Northwestern medical team that kept on pushing. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. That does it for us tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.